you know, I, I think there's no question that uh, some of the damaging rhetoric uh, that we saw uh during the prior administration, uh, blaming, uh, you know, calling COVID, uh, you know, the Wuhan virus or other things um, uh, led to, um, you know, um, perceptions of the Asian American community that are inaccurate. They're there seeking asylum. First time ever we've told people they can't come to America. That ends. The cage is closed. We immediately surge to the border. All those people are seeking asylum. Let me be clear. There's no room uh, in our classrooms for things like critical race theory. Teaching kids to hate their country and to hate each other is not worth one red cent of taxpayer money. Here, here, Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida, perhaps your next president of the United States. Who knows? I think he's probably the closest thing to Donald Trump uh, without some of the drawbacks uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, Trump had it, but uh, this is a guy who is who walks the walk and he is an alpha and he is um, he has incredible resolve and he takes a, a beating by the press from the press and he just uh, keeps on ticking Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Unfortunately, Al Shaddock is going to have to go to work in um, uh, forty minutes. In forty minutes, so that's going to wrap it up for us. Then, well, we got a lot to talk about until we get to that. St. Patrick's Day, obviously, a huge day in the youth of young gallivanting Tom Shaddock. <laughs> and you know, one of those occasions is a provides the perfect snapshot of my life and. It would really be all you need to know. I, um, in St. Patrick's Day, I think the 1995 or 96, Mm -hmm. I was in at I was at a bar with uh, obviously friends in the in Cambridge Mm -hmm. called the Phoenix. The the Phoenix, I think it's still there. I hope it's still there. It's an Irish bar in the in 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 the Central Square. We used to hang out there because I was a. guideless drunkard and that's what we did so now so we're hanging out i'm with jay who you know my friend jay mm-hmm. uh and uh, his wife dana who mm-hmm. you know i do and uh, they weren't married then i don't think and it, i worked at a hotel back then so my another friend of mine was at the bar named brian brian's from ireland okay so and me and brian brian are talking to two ladies two women you know, we're mm-hmm. only 23 or whatever at the time. So two, two girls. And and somehow, I don't know how this is possible, but one of them, he, she was really pretty. One of them kept, she worked at um, uh, not but the thing that was Whole Foods, Bread and Circus mm-hmm. in Central Square. You remember Bread and Circus? I do remember Bread and Circus. So, so it was an earthy, crunchy place, whatever. Anyway, she, this young lady really liked me. And somehow, I didn't wasn't screwing it up. So much to the point where she was telling her friend to have me and Brian, mm-hmm. Sheehy, Brian Sheehy, who now owns a, a whole bunch of Irish bars in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. He started out, but he just worked his, his rear end off and and now owns a bunch of cool bars in San Francisco. Sheehy and I, we're in. These girls like us. And this is like, this is a, a, a marvelously seeming, turning out to be a marvelously successful St. Patty's Day. Okay. So, uh, so they they what they say they want us to come back. Me and she he to come back to their place, which was in near Tufts, actually. Okay. In Somerville. And I made the decision that night, and this is very Tom Shaddock, because I, I am an idiot. I figured, you know, I'd rather hang out with my friend Jay, mm-hmm. and go eat not get nachos from Seven Eleven. Then go with them home. And maybe I'll find her again someday. <laughs> so instead of going back to their place with them, for God knows what, but probably something better than nachos. <laughs> I don't know. I about chose, that. we sat, I was sitting, instead of being in the arms of a beautiful young lady that night, Alice, mm-hmm. I was with my friend. We we're sitting in the rear parking lot of 7 Eleven. Stuff, shoving nachos into our face and processed cheese. That Seven Eleven, by the way, anecdotally was the Seven Eleven that um, the Sarnayevs went in and robbed. Just so you know. Really? Yeah. 
Um, but there's your snapshot of the the, the snap, forward thinking, very logical decision making of Tom Shattuck at in my twenties. Well, you know, I think everything worked out for the best in the end. Well, of course it did. In the <laughs> end, it did. By, by barely last at the eleventh hour, I was uh, saved. But I mean, that is quintessential. There is there is dishonor <laughs> in sitting on the ground of the parking lot. I remember it sitting on the little thing that you in the end of the parking lot, just eating se- nachos. And now, since I'm still twenty three emotionally, mentally. <laughs> I'm actually hungry for those nachos now. Mm-hmm. So um, I want to apologize for being this person, Alice. And, um, you know, I hope on your, your next go round, you uh, choose wisely-er, wisely-er. <laughs> All right, let's get right to it. We got a whole bunch of stuff. <clears throat> I've burned through a bunch of stuff. Uh, obviously, everybody in the country is talking about this murder, this mass murder of uh, these women, most of them Asian, six out of eight, I think, Asian mm-hmm. Uh, this this loser incel sicko weirdo just pos. Yeah, one might have been a man too. Oh, okay. It was just incidental to the whole. Thing. Uh, went in there and and went into a couple of massage pl- parlors. Three, Sorry. three massage parlors around um, Metro jo- uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and um, and then apparently when he was arrested, he was on his way to Florida to. I've heard conflicting things. It's sort of hard with this stuff because it's all developing so fast. So some of the information might not be accurate. You know, as soon as you say it, but he was apparently on his way to Florida to either shoot up more massage parlors or possibly I heard like a pornography company in Florida, maybe. But anyway, he's apparently like this hardcore religious Baptist guy and his dad's a preacher and he was uh, upset about his sex addiction that he struggled with and um so he went and shut up these massage parlors and and killed eight people six of them Asian women and I think one I think one white woman and one other man that I'm not sure is race, but I don't know. But anyway, this has been, you know, spun into the narrative of the Trump anti Asian hate crime exactly. because, because of Trump Wuhan said virus. Wuhan, right. Which of course uh, you know, at this time last year, everybody in the media was calling it the Chinese yeah. virus, so the Wuhan is, virus. There but is that's one. fine. Tr- Trump enjoyed pinning it on somebody who mm-hmm. wasn't the United States anyway. There is one witness who apparently said there's like one news source a korean language news source apparently reporting that one witness said he shouted he was going to kill all the asians when he did this so i mean i don't know anything's possible and like i said to you earlier what you're going to see the left do here with the narrative and i've already seen some people saying it is that even if it wasn't motivated by anti-asian hatred the fact that it was this like anti-sex worker hatred is also related to the asianness of the women because western culture hypersexualizes asian women and views right. them as this has absolutely been completely and totally made into a hate crime and and expected fallout mm-hmm. from our 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 culture which of course is guilty of all sorts of of uh, various forms of racism and um, mm-hmm. and uh, bigotry, and of course, there's nobody the the person who holds the uh, you know the heavyweight championship belt of all racism is Trump. So everything has to go back to Trump and Jen Psaki, of course, because in the spirit of unity, is happy to divide the country mm-hmm. more. In the Oval Office, he didn't want to make a connection on the motivation of yeah. the in Atlanta. But to broaden it out, why does the president think attacks on Asian Americans are increasing in this country? Why does he think that's happening? Well, uh, he he wanted to be very clear because there's an ongoing FBI investigation, right? And he didn't want to attribute motive. There are law enforcement authorities who do that. Um, and it's important to note when uh, when the uh, when the investigation is concluded or not, so that was a, a bar he was attempt working to respect there. Um, you know, I, I think there's no question that uh, some of the damaging rhetoric uh, that we saw uh, during the prior administration, uh, blaming uh, you know calling COVID uh, you know the Wuhan virus or other things. Um, uh, led to, um, you know, um, perceptions of the Asian American community that are inaccurate, unfair. What a complete indictment of the American people. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Like, we all know that the virus was from Wuhan. That's not a, ra- a hate crime. It's not a racist thing. Mm-hmm. And I've been reading the New York Times article, and I just read a Vox article. It also said Trump's racist rhetoric about mm-hmm. the virus. Because he called it the China virus. How is that racist, by the way? Isn't that geographic? 
Uh, you would think so. We're calling the variants the South Africa variant yes. and the British We're variant. We're allowed to name <laughs> countries and continents. That's still okay. You know? I think so. That's what I've heard. Uh, have uh, raised, um, you know, threatening, uh, have, has elevated threats against uh, Asian Americans. And we're seeing that uh, around the country. That's why even before the events of horrific events of last night, he felt it was important to raise this issue, elevate it during his first primetime address, why he signed the executive order uh, earlier in his presidency. And he will continue to look for ways to elevate and talk about this issue. Yeah, I mean, this, of course, are trying to be purpose, purposely divisive because they're cynical politicians. And mm -hmm. this administration is as cynical as it gets. We've already seen this. But they're also doing a disservice to Asian Americans who are get, getting beat on, and uh, many of whom are in viral videos getting clocked in the streets because they're not being truthful about what's going on. In some of the more high-profile cases that we have seen here, Mm -hmm. uh, the characteristics of the perpetrators are not being talked about in the name of the reckoning, or in the name right. of the national reckoning we have to have. Mm -hmm. And even, it's interesting, e there aren't even, I couldn't even find articles that dare to go near it. The closest things I can find about uh, these crimes are, for instance, there's in The Guardian, there's an article saying, Black and Asian unity, quote, Attacks on elders spark reckoning with racism's roots. So they go right past the actual acts that are happening, mm -hmm. some of these high-profile acts, to the fact that those leaders in the community, Asian and black leaders, are trying to get together to make sure this doesn't perpetuate racism, especially at a time when young black men are already being uh, victimized. Mm -hmm. So we're stepping carefully over the detail right. to a secondary concern that will mm -hmm. not go to remedy the actual crime in these in what we have happening here. Right. And there's just such a lack of curiosity, right? That that you know, they're not even interested in what the details of the crimes are and finding out what motivated the crime and what happened and why, which you would think you would need to do in order to solve whatever underlying problem is causing the crime, but they don't feel that they need to do that because they already know it's the evil thoughts in Trump's heart are somehow spiritually influencing people all across America to attack Asians. That's that's in their imagined worldview, right. what's happening that right. you know the, are, are the influencing evil people in ultra blue states, people of a demographic mm -hmm. who did not vote for Trump, right, and wouldn't likely to be influenced by him. And most of the spike in anti Asian violence did occur. Um, it's primarily driven by L A. and New York, the anti Asian violence. So that was one statistic that I was able to tease out of some of the craziness but yeah there's been an 150 percent increase in anti-asian violence according to nbc news and most of that is driven by new york and la which as you say are not places that are likely to be influenced by trump but again we get back to this critical theory idea about racism that people have these deep unknown even to them biases that are influenced by words and things that people say and impressions that they have and that that causes physical things and so they don't bother to look for you know actual causes in the community of what's going on why i mean and crime has spiked everywhere in urban areas mm -hmm. over the past year or so it's been a crazy spike in crime so is this part of the same phenomenon we won't know because we're not interested in actually analyzing what's going on we just need to find a way to blame trump's deep interior racism for somehow you know some guy in la punching an asian person it makes no sense whatsoever but it's just pure feeding into a narrative and now we're seeing them do the same thing with this crazy person who can't deal with his own problems and decided to go kill a bunch of women because he's sexually frustrated or whatever his problem is. But, uh, you know, it's anything to feed the narrative. So we're not interested in finding out, you know, why he did it or what played into it, what went wrong in the system that this... I lived the lie. That, uh... That he did this to these women, mostly women, I believe. And right. So, so, but in this, yes, and this is obviously this is far more egregious than shoving somebody in the street. Mm -hmm. and, Although, uh, at least one of those people died. Right. Yes. 
But yes. but yeah, but this was a mass shooting, clearly, and the and it it is an egregious crime, and it's evil and terrible. And you know, I I hope that you know we hear the names of these women, and they don't just get shoved into this narrative of Trump's anti Asian crime wave that that is a bizarro, not based in reality narrative. So I mean, I don't know. We'll see what comes out of this conversation but it doesn't seem to me like all these people that are bent on stuffing this into their predetermined narrative have any curiosity at all about why something like this happened and how we can prevent it well you know what you you make the the bigger point too is that we're not talking about the spike in violent crime in cities Mm -hmm. we haven't since this summer It, it has been it has been almost washed away the fact that accompanying the Black Lives Matter protests very often were uh, violence in the streets and looting and just violent acts. And I mean, I mean everybody could see them. Right. You know, see, and I had this famous Chiron, you know, saying everything's calm now with the explosion. You know, so it, 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 because it feels too good to have this this racial reckoning and there's corporate buy-in and all sorts of the, the white middle class everywhere is joining the, the performance. It, it felt too good to admit at all to, to that this that half of this was a very bad and damaging thing this summer. Mm-hmm. So we pretended that you, that there was no threat of COVID while it was happening. Right. We pretended that that, that, it, that it was actually in, it was actually in service to battling a public health, mm-hmm. uh, you know, threat, which was racism. Right. And we have, we've just, we didn't acknowledge, we will not acknowledge the spike in crime, the, the crime that happened then, and the subsequent spike in crimes around black communities, mm-hmm. which uh, is unfortunately leading to more victims in these black communities and, and other communities, as a matter of fact. Because cops in some places won't or cannot engage. Some places, it is ordained by mayors and civic leaders that they may not engage. Like we talked about the George Floyd uh, autonomous zone. We talked about all the autonomous zones that came about. So it's 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 it, what what bothers me most about it mm-hmm. is that we continue to somehow be patting ourselves in the back more about how good we we're what how how much good we did this year. This last year, the this country was terrible. Right. Last year, terrible. We talk. You're talking about Asians and and how they've had it uh, tough uh, historically with the Exclusion Act and the Geary Act and uh, internment for, camps. And... Well, yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and for a time, for a time, Asians yeah. had no, just like blacks and, and other people had no um, had no representation in the courts. You know, you were you were not treated like a person. Mm-hmm. Well. This is not an act of Congress, and this is not an executive order in turning people. But what this country did, and what this country, both politically and culturally, sanctioned last year, is right up there with some of the most egregious things we've done to races in this country's history. Absolutely. And, you know, in terms of what you said about, like, the spike in crime and how these protests and this social justice reckoning played into it, the other thing that I wonder if it played into it is also all these lockdowns, both the economic instability for a lot of people that came with the lockdowns, and in addition to that, the psychological isolation and the strain on people. I mean, I know that we've seen an increase in... um you know, overdose and suicide deaths. Is it possible that that also plays into a rise in violent crime, including anti-Asian crime? I mean, so these things are society level problems. It's not clear that Trump said Wuhan virus and a bunch of people just went out and attacked Asian people, but crime definitely went up for everybody. I'm seeing the same thing around, um, around crime against trans people, right? NBC had this big article, like, huge spike in anti-trans crime, like, murders of trans people are up 266% in 2021. Well, that sounds really bad as a top-line number, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. You want to take a wild guess uh, what the number increased from and to? Uh, you already told me, so I'll let you just do it. It's uh, It went from 3 to 11 right. murders. So that's the 266% increase. And that's 
an interesting choice of a way to frame this when everybody's seeing an uptick in violent crime. And so and so they're saying that this wave of anti-trans crime is happening because of these bills that places are putting forward to do trans sports, that it's making everybody, that, you know, to keep uh, biological males out of girls' sports, that that is making people hate trans people, so they're going out and killing them, that that's, like, the idea <laughs> on that. So, so that it's, like, hate against trans people is what's causing this. But, but yeah, but violent crime's up everywhere, and economic instability is up everywhere. Is Not that- everywhere. It's up everywhere in marginalized communities right true so right. yeah upper middle class so professionals that or, can work remotely they're right. not economically unstable yes. it's not up here no all the good people up here who are or or, or or in the suburbs who were all for all the protests and mm-hmm. pretended to not see the fallout and just said the no the, the fallout fallout is they're breaking things that have insurance these are, these are things not people those people had no skin in the game Right. And all they did is take Facebook pictures and Instagram and show how what how good they were, you know, and have their kids, uh, you know, virtue signal to their class and show everybody how what a good noble. But they have no skin in the game. They're not going to these uh, neighborhoods right. where that suck now that are just absolutely being just uh, uh, just attacked, assaulted by criminals. They don't have to worry about any of that stuff. That's a TV. That's a a segment of the news that they may or may not watch right so i mean i don't know it's very very sad what happened in atlanta i look forward to justice being served to this man that did this because it's terrible and and to finding out and learning more about about what was the cause of this because um you know i think we all need to take a step back when something like this happens and say you know why did this happen what what was this person doing what was the motivation or you know did we fail in mental health care or did we fail in doing gun background checks or or what what was the breakdown that caused this person to go out and do this right but we do and to remedy it to to actually analyze and and you, you know, know investigate mm-hmm. that's what needs to happen but this crap with Saki pulling this crap saying it's mm-hmm. trump it's ridiculous they did this uh, with the um with the nightclub in florida it was the nightclub um the, pulse the pulse nightclub was mm-hmm. also trump's fault somehow because he just was anti-gay somehow and mm-hmm. he, they blamed him for that and that wasn't even the was that it, even in the trump years you know, he was running for president. Oh, okay. So, yes, he created the climate of hate that wanted that made people want to mm-hmm. kill people. That was not even the shooter's primary target. That right. was a secondary target. He was going to shoot a shopping center down the street. Right. And it looked too hot, so he went to the nightclub. But no, Where he no, but was a nobody, patron also, possibly. Yes, but I nobody mean, cared. Right. And he actually had more of a tie to Trump's opponent. You know, than, right. And, but fine. But because mm-hmm. we're too... Especially in the big coastal cities, we are too concerned with our own tribal battles more than anything else, and right. nothing matters. Doesn't matter who the player. At that time, the players were the shooter and the people in the, in the nightclub. Uh, over the summer, the players were, you know, the people rioting or protesting mm-hmm. uh, versus the cops. It doesn't matter if the players are some psycho uh, with a gun who, who murders uh, people in the massage parlors. They don't care uh, really about addressing these situations it's all just tools for the tribal warfare that's it exactly it's like everybody whenever something like this happens everybody holds their breath to find out who who the perpetrator is so they can use it to beat the other side up with it you know even like at the marathon bombings there was a whole article that somebody wrote i forget where it was it was like please don't let it be a muslim when it was Mm -hmm. the marathon bombings like just you know, well, so people were speculating at, at the beginning of it that oh wait, you know what? Tea party it, patriots because yes, tax is, day. Yes, exactly. Because mm-hmm. it was April fifteenth. But yeah, but people definitely said like, please don't let it be a Muslim. And then they were all excited too when the video came out, and they were like, it just looks like a regular white guy. Yes, you know because they they didn't like look swarthy. They're from Eastern Europe, and so you know, I, everybody should pause. Take a second and wait to find out what happened before you try and slot it into your predetermined story mm-hmm. of why this means that you need to pass a minimum wage or why it needs that you need to ban porn or whatever whatever thing it is that you need to – your policy goal of the day that you want to try and fit this into. Why don't you mm-hmm. just wait a second because people are dead and see you know, well, what the actual cause of the event is before you And it's the same start. exact thing with the kids in cages and the border right. situation. 
and this whole thing. It doesn't matter. They they cared so much about kids just just a couple of years ago. Right. Now, no, no. They'll only care about kids now if they can say somehow that it's Trump's policies that causes. But Trump very clearly two years ago it signaled to uh, to uh, Latinos, Latinx people, mm-hmm. uh, what his uh, Biden signaled what his intentions were. This is him with Jorge Ramos in one of the town hall kind of events. Biden, as a presidential candidate in 2008, you supported the border wall saying. Unlike most Democrats, I voted for 700 miles of fence. This is what you said. Then you served as vice president in an administration that deported 3 million people, the most ever in U.S. history. Did you do anything to prevent those deportations? I mean, you've been asked this question before and refused to answer, so let me try once again. Are, are, Are you prepared to say tonight that you and President Obama made a mistake about deportations? Why should Latinos trust you? What Latinos should look at is comparing this president to the president we have is outrageous, number one. We didn't lock people up in cages. We didn't separate families. We didn't do all of those things, number one. Number two, number two, by the time this is the president who came along with the DACA program. No one had ever done that before. This is the president who sent a le- legislation to the desk saying he wants to find a pathway for the 11 million undocumented in the United States of America. This is the president who's done a great deal. So I'm proud to have served with him. What I would do as president is several more things because things have changed. I would, in fact, make sure that there is, we immediately surge to the border. All those people are seeking asylum. They deserve to be heard. That's who we are. We're a nation that says. Uh, I'm sorry. Say it again, Candy. I would have them immediately surge to the border when I'm president. <laughs> surge to the border, tr- uh, Biden says. If you want to flee and you're fleeing oppression, you should come. Come I'm- on up, he says. Oh, my goodness. They're there seeking asylum. First time ever we've told people they can't come to America. That ends. The cage is closed. Mm. We immediately surge to the border. All those people are seeking asylum. They deserve to be heard. That's who we are. We're a That's nation that we says are. if you want to flee and you're fleeing oppression, you should come. And those who come seeking asylum, we should immediately have the capacity to absorb them, keep them safe until they can be heard. A, a 15. There we go. Come on up. Come on in. We're open. Print T-shirts if you'd like to, which many of them have. If you've seen any of the clips, right. this administration absolutely barfed all over itself when it came to handling this crisis. It was remarkable. Trump had made a deal. This situation was stabilized. Trump had made a deal. The Mexican military was sweeping large areas of the border, guarding the start the border from the south, making sure that people wouldn't there wouldn't be incursions from the south into the United States. It's a deal we had with them. Not a, that's not even to talk about the when we were turning people away, deporting people who were trying to get in, and uh, and having people wait in Mexico while it was all adjudicated. Right. The, Biden you might came say- and he s- smashed this thing. He he just he he smashed this very solid piece of policy uh, for the celebratory photo op. Mm-hmm. Um, he just smashed it into bits. We had a sound policy after a lot of pain. Right. You might even say that, you know, the Trump policy actually prevented a lot of kids in cages, it appears now. Yes. Because it seems like the, the at, after the Trump policy ended, there were a lot more kids in cages all of a sudden. So, and, you know, I, I've read anecdotally in some news stories, you know, it, these immigrants who are coming here feel betrayed like biden's betrayed them like he told them to come and now they're getting turned away some of them are getting deported they are having to wait in mexico and the the people who are running shelters on the mexican side of the border who are trying to deal with this problem this huge surge and people are saying that now a lot of the unaccompanied minor surge is happening because people are getting turned away sent back and then they're just sending their kid out by themselves to try and cross back over as just the kid <clears throat> great so, situation so uh, because they're hearing The Biden people say, well, we're not separating families, but when minors come on their own, then they can just stay. So it's it's obviously a case of the Biden's team, Biden team's messaging. Clearly, you can't say that this was happening under Trump because, you know, although obviously 
we were processing people at the border under Trump, the scale has increased enormously. That's why they're having to open new facilities. That's why they had to dump all the COVID guidelines for social distancing, and then now they're running them all at more than full capacity. They're, they're, out they're of at space. the Dallas Convention Center. Right. It's now a, a refugee camp. And they so, have FEMA in there who's running a disaster site. It's crazy. So George Stephanopoulos is now helping the administration do some cleanup on this, or trying to. Some heartbreaking scenes down there. Yeah right now and a lot of the migrants coming in saying they're coming in because you promised to make things better it seems to be getting worse by the day was it a mistake not to anticipate this surge well first of all there was a surge the last two years and 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 19 and 20 there was a surge as well this one might be worse no well it could be but here's the deal (laughs) we're sending back people to first of all the idea that Joe Biden said come, because I, I heard the other day that they're, they're coming because they know I'm a nice guy and I won't they're do what They're saying Trump this. Did. Yeah. Well, here's <laughs> the deal. They're not. The adults are being sent back. Number Hold on. One, once again. Hold on, Joe. Once again, this is Joe Biden. They're there seeking asylum. First time ever we've told people they can't come to America. That ends. The cage is closed. We immediately surge to the border. All those people are seeking asylum. They deserve to be heard. That's who we are. We're a nation that says if you want to flee and you're fleeing oppression, you should come. And those who come seeking asylum, we should immediately have the capacity to absorb them, keep them safe until they can be heard. A 15. Okay, so take it away, Joe. Number one. That's number one. No, number two, what do you do with an unaccompanied child that comes to the border? Do you repeat what Trump did? You don't invite them, I would say. Stop attracting them to start. Stop telling people, oh, if you just drop your kid off at the border, they'll get free health care and free school while you figure out how to come. Right, and that it's getting better and better. Right. And that you're not going to have ICE asking questions now. Do you repeat what Trump did? Take them from their mothers, move them away, hold them in cells, et cetera? We're not uh, doing that. So what we're doing it's happening is right now. brought in brought in HHS and also brought in FEMA to provide for enough safe facilities for them to not to get out of the control of the border patrol, which are not designed to hold people for a long periods of time, particularly children. Get them out of those facilities. And can most- you imagine if if he just took responsibility? What that would sound like? How odd that would sound? Yeah, and like refreshing. This guy is just as cynical as they come. Just mm-hmm. as cynical as they come. Most of them come with a phone number to that they have someone in the country. So what we're doing is we're putting together an entire organizational structure so that within seven days, you're able to get in the phone, contact that number, find out whether there is a mother or a father, whether it is safe, whether it is a secure circumstance, to get the child to that adult how do you cut through the red tape and make sure those kids get to a contact as quickly as possible our reporters on the scene are saying they're seeing total mayhem there right now well what you get what you have to do is you have to try to get control of the mess that was inherited (laughs) yeah (laughs) things were stable on january 20th shortly thereafter they were not stable way to get control of the mess that was inherited I mean, look, here's what our, the, the, the plan is. You may remember oh, God. when we had this unaccompanied children on the border when Barack was president, he called we me back. Remember. I was in Turkey and said, you got to take care of this. And I was able to get a bipartisan bill passed for almost $800 billion to go to the root cause of why, why people are leaving. Why are they leaving El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras? Because they're in terrible circumstances, either because of natural disasters and hurricanes, gangs, or violence. They're trying to escape, and that's why they're coming. So what I did, I spent close to 100 hours with the leaders of those three countries and the UN, making sure that what we would do, for example, in one of the- Whatever you did, didn't take uh, for that long a period of time, Joe. Yeah, so why are they coming now, Joe? major cities down there they said the crime rate's terrible that's why people are leaving this particular city but we have no street this is why you don't trust government to handle a coronavirus these are incompetent bureaucrats they he actually probably believes he's doing a good job we're doing committees we're going to bring in more un people we've got fema we've got i mean we're doing all sorts of wheel spinning we're going to have more uh blue ribbon panels well there'll be some reports 
We'll spend another eight hundred million dollars and go sit uh, by, uh, you know, put streetlights in random y- South American cities. Yes, and have have uh, lunch with the um, with the you know the the Ecuadorian consulate uh, members at the White House. We'll have them in. It's like this is just BS, bureaucratic BS. None of this is pragmatic. This is this is all after the fact uh, mm-hmm. treatment. None of this will stem the tide. Right. Of migrants, especially when you invite them in and insist they come in and insist that they surge in. And the government said, give us the money. We put the-. I said, I'm not going to give you the money, but I'll tell you what. Show me what you need. I'll get contractors down there. We'll put in the street lights for you because a lot of corruption down there. And guess what? Violence came down. And that's it's going to take some time, though, to get those policies in place again. That's, you know what? <laughs> With these kids complaining about being treated horribly, not being able to see the sun in two days or more, not being adequately taken care of down there. To have him wax on about his streetlight initiative uh, and and pat himself on the back doesn't give you faith that this is going to be resolved. Especially since they're still not being firm. Right, exactly. And, you know, where's the accountability for something like that? We just have to take you at your word that if we install streetlights in South American countries, then magically people will stop showing up at the border. Well, hopefully, but like you can't really claw that back if it turns out it doesn't work out that way. Do you have to say quite clearly, don't come? Yes, I can say quite clearly, don't come. And what we're in the process of getting set up, and it's not going to take a whole long time, is to be able to... He uh, shuffled past that one quickly. I can say it, but but, but at the same time, he is so afraid of the hard left on this. He is so afraid of the amnesty folks that he doesn't want to say don't come. He doesn't mean don't come. He said the words, he embedded them in his explanation but weave them immediately into something else something uh, you know another uh, carrot mm-hmm. rather than the stick this guy is still by this interview he's still saying come apply for asylum in place so don't leave your town or city or community we're going to make sure we have facilities in those cities and towns run by the department of by dhs and i like all- this so we'll bring america to you <laughs> So you won't come here. Yeah, we'll set up the application center in your hometown. We'll come to you. Put an Apple store in there. You think you got lights now? We'll have many more lights. We'll create a little America where you live so that we politically can survive this. So access with HHS, the Health and Human Services, to say you can apply for asylum from where you are right now. Make your case. We'll have people there to determine whether or not you are able to meet the requirements. Joe, they don't want to be where they are now. That's why they're moving from where they are now to the United States. Because there's a whole bunch of stuff here. We're going to give you the choice. You can just do it from where you are now and not get all the goodies when you come to the United States. Or... (laughs) (laughs) Pepper is next to me. Hi, Pepper's tail. (laughs) But it's interesting. You know, Tucker had the... um, I think it was... Was it the president of... Who did he have on... President of maybe no, not Venezuela. President of a, El Salvador. Okay. I was thinking on, and they were talking about how I- I- immigration hurts both countries. This mm-hmm. this you know it hurts them because they're losing a lot of talented people out of the workforce. Right. Who are going north, and they're getting you know remittances from from them. Mm-hmm. You know once they you know they're sending money back, but they still, it's a net loss for them. Right. And then for in it's just it was very it was a good I should have grabbed it maybe I'll grab it for later the guy was an yeah. interesting guy he seemed about twenty six years old too. Environment you qualify for asylum, that's the best way to do this. In addition to that, well, we also change the circumstances on the ground in those communities. You're going to diminish the reason why people want to leave in the first place. It's not like someone sitting in Guadalajara right now in Mexico, which is not the biggest problem right now, and saying I got a great idea. Let's sell everything we have, give it to a coyote, give them our kids, take them across the border, leave them in a the desert where they don't speak the language. Won't that be fun? That's not why people come. They come because their circumstances are so bad. Now, some co- coyotes exist now. Oh, yeah, well, Trump remember? Trump mentioned that last year. And, and, and yeah. He was talking about the actual canine. <laughs> Trump literally thinks coyotes carry children across yeah. the border. Because they want a better opportunity for economic reasons. They don't qualify. 
And so in the meantime, what we should be doing is making sure we provide beds for these children. By the way, over 50 percent. Well, then provide beds for the children. Right. That's what we should be doing. <laughs> well, do you know somebody uh, in power? Of the children coming are ages 16 and 17. 16 and 17, they're not, most of them are not little babies. 1% are young, young kids. And so what we're doing now... I feel less bad. <laughs> ...is we're providing for... In the past, what you do is HHS would take them to licensed providers. So there's beds, security, where there's health care, there's, they're, 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 they're fed, they're cared for, while they determine whether or not there is someone in the United States they're entitled to go to. And that's what we're in the process of doing now. We will have, I believe, by the next month, enough of those beds to take care of these children who have no place to go but they need to be taken care of while we're while, while they're but the well, vast majority you guess get some more don't come the vast majority of people crossing the border are being sent back they're being sent back immediately sent back wait that isn't it sending them on the dangerous journey back or isn't that bad? Five, turn five. kick why don't we do get other piece of legislation about uh, uh stuff that auto plays on web pages <laughs> all right so you got to go soon so let's get uh so I wanted to update you on social distancing guidelines because this is really important. Um, that you know, Fauci the other day said they were looking at possibly uh, switching down to three feet from six feet, mm -hmm. and you and I were wondering how they came up with six feet in the first place. And um, so we got some clarity because uh, the New York Times did a big article on you know three feet or six feet and which is better, and uh, they say. This, now spurred by a better understanding of how the virus spreads and a growing concern about the harms of keeping children out of school, some public health experts are calling on the agency to reduce the recommended distance in schools from six feet to three. It never struck me that six feet was particularly sensical in the context of mitigation, said Dr. Ashish Jha, dean of the Brown University School of Public Health. I wish the CDC would just come out and say that this is not a major issue. On Sunday... Well, <laughs> well thanks, Doc. On Sunday, yeah. Dr. By Fauci, the way, we didn't, we don't really know the, the numbers. Nobody's really looking. That's not tech, my mm -hmm. job to look into that, is it? Whose job is it to look into that? Well, uh, six is a nice even number. The idea remains contentious, in part because few studies have directly compared different distancing strategies. But the issue also boils down to a devilishly difficult and often personal question: How safe is safe enough? There is no magic threshold for any distance, said Dr. Benjamin Linus, a specialist in infectious diseases at Boston University. There's risk at six feet. There's risk at three feet. There's risk at nine feet. There's risk always. He added, the question is, how much of a risk and what do you give up in exchange? The origin of the six... Are these guys <laughs> in medicine or philosophy? <laughs> what is safe anyway? Is it a construct? Is it a reality? Am I safe now from a meteor? Yes, pretty much. Would I be safer under the ground? Yes, a, a degree more safety. Is six feet safe? What is safe, though? <laughs> the origin if, of... If six feet is safe, and I, I'd almost guarantee someone gets stabbed in the neck by a pencil. But is it safe for the flu? Is it safe for the coronavirus? The origin of the six-foot distancing recommendation is something of a mystery. It's almost like it was pulled out of thin air, said Lindsay Marr, an expert on viral transmission at Virginia Tech University. <sighs> so it goes on about respiratory droplets and everything, but there we go. Pulled out of thin air. They so we don't know. Yeah. So that's great. That's great. So since we're not going to look into it, we don't know. Somehow Jake Tapper managed to find a st study that somebody in Massachusetts did, and so six suddenly became three. Tapper says, uh, what about the study in Massachusetts that says it's three feet? And, uh, and Fauci says, uh, okay, it's three feet now. Alice is giving me the rap sign. Very quickly, I just want to play, tell you, if you're in Europe, you in the United Kingdom, you might be screwed. The, the commissar for uh, the uh, EU, uh, Fraulein Ursula von der Leyen, <laughs> has decided that the, the EU is going to shut off exports of the vaccine. Open roads run in both directions. And this is why we need to ensure that there is reciprocity and proportionality. And uh, I want to be clear on reciprocity. Um, if the situation does not change 
we will have to reflect on how to make exports to vaccine producing countries dependent on their level of openness. Ooh, so we Frau are von der Leyen is not pleased and they will stop yeah. the exports of vaccines if you don't start sharing. Yeah, so she's primarily mad at England, which cleverly left the EU before they screwed up the vaccine thing. But uh, anyway, we'll talk to you more next time. Off the to the m- warehouse, Alice Shattuck mm-hmm. goes. In the meantime, you can reach out to us on Twitter at Burn Barrel Pod. You can talk to us at Facebook.com slash Burn Barrel Podcast or uh, send us an email, Burn Barrel Podcast at gmail.com. We're also on YouTube. You can uh, make a comment there, subscribe to watch the video versions of the podcast, etc. Two more hogs got the fever.